Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And today we're going to talk about food chains and food webs. Most of you are somewhat familiar with food chains. Um, maybe even food webs you've been experienced or have some experience with. It's taught to you when you're pretty young. Maybe first, second, third grade, somewhere in that range um, is where you first get uh, exposed to what a food chain is or what a food web is. Now, what I'm going to show you today is that food chains and food webs are often not used very well until you get into high order ecology where you in include everything that could possibly be part of that food web. Okay, so let's just look at this kind of food web. This is not really a chain because it has more than one group in each spot. So this would be a, a very simplistic food web. You can see here you have some primary producers. You got, um, well actually I'm sorry, you have no primary producers which is an issue kind of with this food web is we should have a layer that's you know underneath this uh, that would be dropping maple leaves that would be dropping dead leaves of other species dropping rotten wood etc to supply these organisms that are going to be consuming that decaying material these organisms would be called detritivores that would be consuming that material. Okay. Now, obviously, if this is a detritivore food web, then there's no need to put the primary producers in, but you also are missing a lot of other things. When you make assumptions like many species, well, each one of these leaves, whether it's coming from a maple, an oak, an elm, whatever it is, it will have different chemical properties and you know, the leaf might be broken down faster by one group of isopods than it would be broken down by another group of isopods. So that's, you know, another reason why this food web's not complete. But at any rate, these arrows are showing the direction of energy. So energy is being broken down by things like bracket funguses and bacteria and archaea other types of funguses that labeled here puffballs. Okay, so the log itself, the energy in, in that log, the carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, these elements along with any leftover carbohydrates and things like that are being broken down and re reutilized as energy for these organisms. Same thing over here with decaying dead animals, etc. You're going to have some of these organisms that would be consuming that. Okay. From that level, it shows the energy going to another group. Okay. So you might have earthworms that are eating up archaea. You might have millipedes that might be consuming, you know, different types of fungi, etc. And then here you can see that we're jumping that insect group okay, because these are invertebrates. Okay pill bugs and maggots, which is, just mainly means fly larvae and crickets, it's jumping straight to vertebrate level. Now, that's not, that's not normally the case. You'd have more layers of invertebrates here, invertebrates that would eat um, insect larvae, that would eat pill bugs or isopoda, that would eat crickets, okay? and you would have these guys eating these guys directly and the individuals that are in between. Okay. Then you have this vertebrate group that are eating different types of detritivores, different types of insects. Okay. They're consuming that material. Mind you that a lot of these organisms would also possibly consume living 
material like in the form of primary producers or plants. And then that level is being consumed by top tier predators. Okay, so if we look at this, again, I said this is a very simplistic food web. It's nice because there's pretty pictures on it. It's nice because it's easy to recognize what's eating what, where's the energy flowing, in what direction. Okay. Um, the other thing is all of these organisms should have arrows back down here because they're all going to die at some point. So they're all going to be dead organisms at some point. See, even these guys and these guys and, you know, the, the other uh, fungi and stuff like that. They're all going to be dead organisms, so they flow back in. So what does it look like when you actually calculate every possible connection? This is what it looks like when you calculate every possible connection okay so this is a marine situation where you're looking at the marine connection okay, in a marine area in an estuary um, and you're looking at well in the border between an estuary and kind of open ocean and you're going to look at the role that all these organisms play so you know we have up here we have like the great black backed goal uh, we have nothing consuming it okay? which still means that this doesn't uh, this is not a complete food web because something could eat that great black backed goal and if it doesn't then when it dies it's going to reestablish material back into the system but at any rate, you can see that this great back goal is not eating just one thing. It's eating four different types of material, some of which are way down in, you know, in the food web. They might be, you know, redfish or something like that. And then some of it would be up here in, in like cod and some will be over here like in salmon right? and so you get this broad scale of what is consuming you also see this little piece here so this is another piece that's often missing from food chains I don't know if you can see this but this is a lamprey and you can see that the lamprey has an arrow that turns back on itself. A lot of these fish should have arrows that turn back on themselves. And maybe they do. It's hard to see um, in the mess of, of arrows and lines. But in this one and the hake, you can see that that's exactly what's going on. And even the hal halibut here, right, you can see that's what's going on. That, that's exactly what's happening. They eat themselves. Right? They produce young. And then if the young are, you know, in the path of the adults, the adults will eat them. Uh, and, you know, it's, it happens a lot in different fish species that they'll eat their own species. Um, so you'll see that a, a lot in very complex food webs. You'll, s you'll see these bins that the arrow goes up and comes back, um, which means that they consume themselves or their own species. Okay, so let's dive into what these, the simplistics of these. Okay, we're going to build on some of these ideas and why, you know, ecologists use a food web that looks like this. And, you know, sometimes policymakers use a food web that looks like this because they're not going to understand a food web that looks like this. It's too complex. So they make it as simple as possible. But when you make it as simple as possible, you miss a lot of those connections. We'll get into that and why it's important to have those connections. So let's look at a food web like this. Here you have a tree. Uh, that tree is what we call a primary producer. It's getting energy in the way of photons. We've talked about this before. This is the process of photosynthesis. 
it's taking those photons, it's converting carbon dioxide and water into glucose, starch, um, other types of carbohydrates. Some heat is lost during this process. The caterpillar, again, this is very simplistic because it just says caterpillar. Well, we know that there's probably a hundred thousand different caterpillars. Um, so a more logical one was, well, what caterpillar are you actually looking at? But in this case, it's, it's simple. It's just to show you the process of a food chain. So it's a caterpillar. It's going to be consuming this green material. Uh, so this is a primary consumer. That primary consumer, as it's consuming this material, it's going to lose the energy, some energy. It's going to be lost as heat. In actuality, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but it's called the 10% rule. This caterpillar is only going to gain 10% of the energy is going to be used for body mass. The rest will be used for other things that are lost. So some of that will be lost as heat. Some of that will be lost as, you know, reproducing tissue, immune system, behavior, moving around, consuming food, etc. But it means that there's only 10% of the original energy is available for the next species up. So that bird, okay, bird, they're pictured here as a robin, American robin, but birds eat caterpillars, some of them do. Okay. They would get that energy. Again, they would lose energy to heat and they would lose energy to other bird functions, okay, behavior, reproduction, okay, these different things, which means that only a portion of that energy is left for the microbes. This bird's going to die. The microbes will also lose heat. Okay? So here it's just showing you that a lot of energy is lost to heat. We're going to talk about those other losses in a little bit. Okay? So food chains are very simplistic. They show the direction that energy flows through the system. Okay? They don't show Typically, they don't show you, show you the specific species that are involved. It's just showing you the direction of energy that's flowing from the system. Okay. Often, those food chains will indicate the trophic level. So what level of organism are they? Are they a primary producer? Are they a primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer? Are they an apex predator, the last little bit? All right. So in, if you're an apex predator, it often means that nothing preys on you and you die of natural causes or accidental causes, etc. But nothing's consuming you while you're alive. Uh, so, again, food chains are simplistic. They're not species specific. They're not geared towards showing you what eats what, but rather where's the flow of energy. Right? How many different consumers are possible in that ecosystem? So producers, like I was talking about before, sometimes they're called primary producers. Sometimes they're just called producers, and there can be a lot of different levels of producers. Uh, you can have producers that are only consumed by a portion of primary consumers, um, some producers that are consumed by just secondary consumers that also consume primary consumers. So it can be very complex in a normal ecosystem because you have a lot more species than just in what's pictured here is grass. Okay? But nonetheless, all producers have the ability to produce their own food. 
which means that they have the ability to do either photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. Most of the time we're talking about photosynthetic organisms. There's not that many chemosynthetic organisms um, that have been discovered, and those systems are often happen within combination of photosynthetic organisms. So you might have a chem chemosynthetic organism which is doing using chemicals to convert things like carbon dioxide or water into carbohydrates but they're using chemicals versus photons so they occur in a region where there's no light. They might also be coupled with organisms that are moving up and down in the water column that are primary producers that use photosynthesis to um, convert carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. We'll look at some examples of this. I don't want you know to bore you with all the details right now. Consumers ingest other organisms. So again, primary producers are what we call autotrophs. Right? They make their own food. Consumers are called heterotrophs. They consume other organisms. Okay? That could be that they consume primary organisms in the form of herbivores. Okay? They could consume secondary tertiary organisms and be considered carnivores. They could consume both, which often happens. You consume both primary producers and secondary, primary, some other consumer, and that makes you an omnivore. You eat both primary and um, secondary or, or some organism that eats primary. And then what's often missing from a food chain is the part that's considered decomposers, which decomposers can break down dead or decaying tissue at any level. So even though there's not an arrow showing from the primary producer here, fungi can break down primary producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, apex predators, Okay. Fungi come in and they can break down at any of these levels. They can consume that material. Okay. And it doesn't, doesn't just have to be a fungus. It doesn't have to be, you know, a fungus. It, it can be bacteria. It can be archaea. Okay. There's, you know, other organisms, invertebrates that, lots of invertebrates that can break down decaying matter and enter in here, um, you know, like worms would enter in in this level as decomposers. Uh, lots of other organisms um, can be part of that decomposition. I showed you at the very first scene, isopods and even crickets and maggots and things like that could enter in as the decomposer in that trophic level. Okay. Food webs show all of the food chains in the community woven together. Right. So, like I said, most food webs that you will see, they like to use these pretty pictures to sh indicate, you know, what the organism looks like, etc. A real, a true food web, however, there's no room for pretty pictures. Normally, it's just the name of the organism and what that organism can consume and what that organism can be consumed by. So in this situation, you know, you, you have this picture of all these invertebrates here where you have mosquitoes and midges and you know, what looks to be a stonefly. Right, so you have these insects that are consumed by, you know, birds. 
that are consumed by you know this bird which is red winged blackbird but consumed by a mallard duck okay but you don't see these insects being consumed by fish so they're kind of missing that component obviously fish eat these types of insects um, you do see a connection here though which is nice to see that these insects are at least some of them mosquitoes are consuming tissue from uh, mammals there should be a connection here you know to the fox etc um, from these mosquitoes even to the birds these birds will be affected by mosquitoes these small mammals by mosquitoes etc so there's a lot of connections that are missing here but what I want to key in on is that mosquito is a parasite and early food webs rarely would ever um, associate parasites in that food web but now the, the new food webs that we are starting to build show that connection why is that important well you're reading parasite rex oh well some of you might be reading parasite rex some of you have asked me about that book okay um but at any rate you guys are going to be learning about diseases like malaria diseases that can be passed from insect uh, to host and in doing so if you know all the possible organisms that that insect would come in contact with then you might know where that disease came from so in the case of you know deer you know we know now that Lyme disease can be harbored in deer ticks can consume a blood meal from deer and then it, they can pass that Lyme disease on to humans okay? but if we don't know all the connections if we don't know where those parasites reside how how many different organisms those parasites can consume then we we won't know what zoonotic diseases possibly occur in the ecosystem so there are some important pieces to that part of the food web other important pieces to that food web is what happens if we decide hey we don't want fox in the ecosystem anymore like we did with wolves in Yellowstone, wolves in the United States, cougars, grizzly bears, okay? When we first inhabited North America, the western part of North America, we eradicated every predator. We didn't want the predators. Well, what happens okay, if you remove the predator? Is it possible certain things might increase their populations might increase up by a lot maybe rabbits okay. we'll look at examples of Australia okay. maybe deer we'll look at examples of Yellowstone maybe pocket mice okay. maybe there's these other organisms once you remove those predators what happens to the organisms underneath the pressure the competition the consumption is gone and now these populations can increase well if these populations increase what could then be decreasing what are these guys eating plants so maybe there's so many deer in the ecosystem that there's no plants left they just eat all of them well then in turn what happens to the rabbit population maybe the rabbits can't compete against the deer okay? so the rabbit population might go down so so by knowing the food web you know what can happen if you remove something tying food webs into ecology is kind of the next step where do those organisms nest where do those organisms reside where do they breed what kind of habitats do they need okay? and that's key and that's where this picture does a pretty good job 
of showing that, hey, look, you need certain things in an ecosystem. You need habitat like trees for the great horned owl. You're going to need some grassy areas for things like deer. You're going to need some water, you know, for things like the fish and the crayfish and the protozoans, the ducks, right, the snakes. And, you know, that complexity or having those pieces allows for this ecosystem to exist and allows for this food web to continue. Let's say we drain the wetland, drain all the water. Fish are all gone, crayfish are gone, protozoans are gone, ducks need it, they're gone. Snakes, most snakes, including this one, are going to be consuming possibly some of these fish, other things. Um, okay. They're gone. Maybe these other organisms need to find a different water source somewhere. The mosquitoes are gone because they need the water to breed. So you really change the ecosystem if you drain the wetland, if you drain the water. Okay. What if you cut down the forest? Same situation. Now, what do you have? Well, the owls are gone, the fox is gone, uh, probably the deer which is using it as shelter is gone, and you've changed your ecosystem again. Okay. So food webs allow us to look at that as long as we look at it with information about where these organisms, what habitats these organisms need. Okay, now easy food webs come when we start looking at ecosystems that are very harsh. Okay? Harsh ecosystems often have very few organisms. They're not very species rich, so they don't have very many species on that landscape. It's even more severe if you remove species from that landscape. So you have here these caribou. Okay, the caribou often eat some kind of green plant material or lichen, other um, other photosynthetic organisms. Okay, uh, let's say the caribou go away. Okay. Well, then you have a lot of pressure from the wolves on these small mammals, pika, snowshoe hares. Okay. Man has nothing to eat in these regions. Uh, so you've really changed the look of that ecosystem. And it's easy to do. You remove the wolves. Now what's left? Sure, your caribou, caribou explode at first. Your rabbits explode. Your pika explode. Your plant communities decrease quite a bit. Your lichen decreases. So there is none left for these organisms to eat. Organ these organisms start getting weak, diseased. Okay? They're overpopulated. Man either has to eat a lot more of these and start eating more of these and more of these, or there's nothing left in the ecosystem. There's no primary producers and no energy being put back into the ecosystem. So you have these connections, and that's where food webs come in and show you those connections. All right, energy pyramids are important for understanding the energetics that go in to a system or the potential energetics that go in this system. Remember that we started stated the first law of thermodynamics which is energy is not created nor destroyed it just changes form. The second law of thermodynamics is that energy is lost. In a system it takes energy to maintain the system and energy is lost as heat when you transfer energy forms. So when you go from one energy form to the next, energy will be lost as heat. Uh, so if you have carbohydrates in plants that were the product of photosynthesis, an animal comes around, eats it, it changes those carbohydrates through a process called cellular respiration. Okay. It changes those carbohydrates into, well, first 
into pyruvate and then into acetyl-CoA and then into a bunch of other intermediates. And each step of the way, energy is released okay, because bonds are being broken. Some of that energy can be utilized. Some of that energy is not, and it's lost to the atmosphere, lost to the surroundings as heat. This is called the 10% rule. Okay? So this is an estimate. Okay? It's not always the case. Sometimes it's a lot less than 10% is being passed. Okay? Sometimes it's more than 10%. But the rule of thumb is that only 10% of the energy from one trophic level is available to the next trophic level. So here you have primary producers. Right? Let's say that the energy storage in those primary producers is 20,000 kilocals. Okay. Insects, invertebrates, okay, small mammals will consume these primary producers. Okay. But only about 2,000 kilocalories still remain as energy. The rest is removed as heat or is utilized by these organisms for other processes that are not related to energy transfer. Okay. These organisms are consumed. Okay. Only 10% is allowed. So you go from 2,000 to 200 kilocalories. These secondary consumers are consumed by tertiary. Now only about 20 calories remains. And then the top predator, the apex predator, only gets two kilocalories from the original 20,000 kilocalories. This tells us a lot. And this is why apex predators, why things like wolves, grizzly bears, eagles, okay, those are apex predators and their populations are really small. There are very few apex predators. Uh, so when you go to Yellowstone or you go to somewhere else and you and you want to see a wolf because you've never seen one in the wild, the odds of you seeing one is far less. There's far less of a chance of you seeing an apex predator than of you seeing an invertebrate or you know even a small rodent. Right? Even secondary consumers, even tertiary consumers. It's these apex predators, their populations are low. For example, let's look at wolves in you know, Wyoming, where you're most likely to see a wolf because of Yellowstone, or Montana, where you're likely to see a wolf because of Yellowstone. Population in Wyoming, maybe there's 250 wolves. In Montana, maybe 150. Okay. 250 wolves, that's it. Okay. The state that's got the most wolves and your best chance to see them is Minnesota. Okay. With maybe 1,000 wolves in Minnesota, maybe 1,500 at, at max. Okay. I mean, if we're talking about something like a primary consumer, I mean, just looking at ants, there might be a thousand ants in one yard by one yard spacing in Yellowstone or um, in parts of Minnesota or even parts of Arizona, wherever you're looking. Okay? So that's part of that rule. Now the rule gets broken when we put humans in the mix. The rule is broken, we put humans in the mix, and we're going to talk about humans and their role on this pyramid because we are at the top of the pyramid. We have the capability, more so than a lot of these other organisms, we have the capability of eating down here at the bottom of the pyramid. If you consume material down here at the bottom of the pyramid, you're getting into that 20,000 kilocalories. If you consume material at this 
primary consumer, you're eating insects or small rodents and things like that, you're looking at a 2,000 kil kilocalorie. Okay. So that's the importance of often when people are talking about how do we, how do we change world hunger, a lot of us need to be consuming at a different portion of the food pyramid or a different portion of the energy pyramid. We need to be consuming more primary producers. That's where the energy is at. That's where the energy hasn't been lost to the system. Okay? And it's more advantageous as a as a apex predator, apex group. That's where it's better to feed. If we just feed at the top, uh, we can't support our 7.7 .7 billion people or whatever we have on the planet planet currently today guys okay, so again heat is lost at each one of the steps along with other material waste material things like that and like I said before some of this energy is not available for consumption some of this energy just it, it's not going to be consumed from the primary producers or primary consumers etc it's not going to be consumed um, for a long period of time. So it might be bound up in this energy model for a while. Okay? But in that conversion, when they are consumed, that heat is being lost and that energy is lost with it. Okay, next time we're going to talk about natural resource cycles. And we're going to talk about things like the water cycle, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, etc. Okay. Till next time.